Good afternoon. We'll get it right one of these days. <laughs> Today, our presentation is all about animal control in Alpena, and we are really happy to have Deputy Michelle Reed here to tell us all about it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. You may have to stop me at some point because once I get going, <laughs> I can talk about this for days, just to warn you. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself um, to start with. I am a certified law enforcement officer uh, county deputy with the Alpena County Sheriff's Office. Um, I've also been a licensed veterinary technician for, I won't tell you exactly how long, but it's been a little over 20 years. <laughs> um, so the combination of the two really makes this the perfect, uh, perfect career for me. And I love it. Um, it's a little bit of law enforcement. It's a little bit of animal welfare. It's a little bit of veterinary technology. Um, so wrapping all those career opportunities into one career is just perfect for me. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the animal control shelter. Uh, I have three part-time staff there. Uh, we just hired the third one this year. We've been running on two part-time staff, which didn't leave a lot of flexibility at all in the schedule. Um, now with three people, it's, it's a little bit more flexible and, um, takes a little bit of stress away from, from the girls. Um, they have a lot to do. It's very, we're a control shelter and I'll get into the difference between a control shelter and a protection shelter momentarily. Um, but it is a control shelter doesn't pick and choose what animals we take in. We are basically, um, we're like a rescue shelter we are rescuing animals from neglect and abuse situations. So the things we see, experience, um, have to deal with on a daily basis can be very physically and emotionally taxing, um, which is where a lot of uh, burnout and compassion fatigue really come into play. Um, the average, it's not life expectancy, but the average time that somebody spends working at a control shelter, the average time is 18 months. That's how emotionally taxing it can be. Um, we see some pretty sad stuff, but we concentrate on the happy stuff. Um, and that's how you get through it day by day. Um, like I said, we are a control shelter. There are two different kinds of shelters. There's control shelters and there's protection shelters. Um, the difference being, there's some similarities and some differences. The similarities would be that we have common missions and goals where you know, we're bringing animals in and we're trying to get them out into uh, forever loving homes. Um, and we're dealing with some of the same animals. We're dealing with cats, we're dealing with dogs. Um, most protection shelters stop there. Some will take in small animals. Um, we deal with anything that's domesticated and livestock. Um, the biggest difference between the two is um, actually legal. Um, is we deal with those animals that have some type of legality associated with them. There's been a crime committed with these animals, whether it was, whether they've been a victim of animal neglect or abuse, um, whether they broke the law by running at large, <laughs> um, you know, whether their owner has an unlicensed dog, because it is a Michigan law that a dog needs to be up to date on rabies and have a dog license. Um, so when there's a legality associated with those animals, that's when we come into play. Um, the biggest thing we do is um, humane investigations. I know everyone, they want to refer to animal control as the dog catcher. And, you know, that's kind of a, what they used to be way back in 1919 when the career position kind of came to be. Um, and that's when actually Michigan law, um, as far as animal law was, Michigan dog law was created in 1919. So when people say, I didn't realize my dog had to be licensed, well, it's only been around for a hundred years. <laughs> so uh, um, anyway, the dog catcher thing kind of changed. I would say there was a big shift in what animal control duties and tasks were associated with that position. Probably 
close to 30 years ago, the biggest, and it's been changing ever since, morphing and getting better ever since. I would say the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a huge shift in what animal control does. We're now more about humane investigations um, and less about the dog catching. Um, people like to use that word as a derogatory thing and I'll own it all day long. Yeah, that's part of my duty. So I'm a dog catcher. Um, but I do a lot of other things too. So if you think you're hurting my feelings by calling me a dog catcher, think again. The shoulders are pretty broad. Um, so that's the biggest difference between a control and a protection shelter. And if you have questions at any time, go ahead and stop me because I am kind of a, I like interaction. I don't want to just stand up here and listen to me, blah, blah, blah all day. Um, so if you have questions that I didn't, I'm just going to touch on subjects. And if it's an interesting subject and you have questions, go ahead and ask. Um, I do have a couple handouts where if I don't touch on a subject or you might not remember what I said about the subject, you should be able to find it here. It's not giving me a call and uh, we can chat about it. So like I said, Michigan dog law was created and, oh. Did you say farm animals too? Yes. Like livestock. Yep. Yeah. Um, do you know when that was oh it would have been a good 30 years ago oh no no <laughs> do, you know do i look that old yeah 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 so um when it comes to burial of livestock there's called a uh it's a it's a Boda law. It's a burial of um, dead animals is what Boda stands for. And there are different, and it, it's mainly associated with livestock, but it can be any animal. Um, we see it a lot with livestock, mostly, mostly cows and horses, um, where there are specific guidelines that have to be followed in order um, to deal with that dead animal. Um, they have to be buried within... 24 hours. Um, that one gets, <laughs> that's probably the biggest violation we see is it's not buried in time. And then if it's buried appropriately, um, especially if like with a horse, if it was euthanized with an overdose of phenobarb um, or not phenobarb, but uh, pentobarbital, because anything that would feed on that carcass is also going to get that drug in them and, and could be harmful to them, which is why these these laws exist. Um, and it's also a, uh, an environmental thing. So needs to be buried within 24 hours, needs to be buried with at least two feet of a substance. What now everyone says, well, what do I do in the winter time? You know, the ground's frozen. You're not going to dig a hole and bury anything. So you can compost those animals. They still need to be buried by two feet of a substance. So that animal can start to comp comp compost and hopefully prevent other animals from digging deep enough to, to get to that carcass. So, yes. Um, if that happens, that will, <laughs> right. So our shelter is at the fairground, so we would think it livestock there. Um, and maybe in a pinch, uh, especially in, in the spring after in the wintertime, a lot of those barns are full of the county, uh, leases that space out to house, uh, vehicles, campers, stuff like that, um, storage. So unfortunately in the wintertime, those barns are probably full of storage and would not be able to be used. Um, I think in the summer, you know, like before fair or anything like that, I think in a pinch, I probably could get permission to do that. Um, do we have anything ready to go? Well, I have a farm. <laughs> so we have housed animals at my farm before, but I do have other people that have come forward and offered to trailer animals or house different kinds of animals or anything like that. So I kind of have a list of people that I can call and say, hey, here's what I have. Um, I hesitate to do stuff like that sometimes because typically if I'm taking possession of somebody's animals, if I'm seizing those animals, they're probably not in real healthy condition. And um, I know personally, if I have that species on my farm or something that could be left in the soil from whatever they are infected with, I don't want 
to bring that to a healthy farm. Um, so it's kind of important to me to find the correct place to house them. Um, I wouldn't want to take a bunch of sick cows to a place that has cows or is going to have cows and make their cows sick too, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that's probably going to need to be addressed in the, in the near future. I've already had um, two cases. One is active right now, so I won't talk too much about it. Um, the other one we're going to court here pretty soon. It was actually three years ago, but we're just going to court now. Um, it was a dairy farm that uh, was starving its animals, and you know they were just dead animals all over. Um, the other one is not a dairy farm. He was raising dairy cows um, for beef, and starving them and you know there were a bunch of deceased animals and, and whatnot um so in those two cases because I didn't have a place that I was comfortable moving sick animals to um because they're not just starving there's there's other things wrong with them because of being in the immunocompromised state there were there were other things that were wrong with them as well um so what I do is I work real close with uh the state state veterinarians from the Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development, or MDARD. You'll hear me talk about MDARD quite a bit. Um, so they came in. Um, they're really good at answering the call when I call them. Uh, they know when I call, it's usually the real deal and somebody needs to come and check things out. So we work together. There's, there's certain enforcement things they can do to help me out, and there's certain things I can do to help them out. So we work as a team. Um, to tackle those types of livestock, um, you know, neglect and abuse type situations. Um, one thing that we have to deal with here in Alpena County that um, many counties throughout the state don't have to deal with is that we are a TB positive county. So in order to move a bovine from one place to another, even if it's just up the road, you need a moving permit. And in order to obtain a moving permit, you have to test those cattle for TB, which is like a three-day process. Um, and then once they're tested and they're negative, then they can be moved. So, which is a problem for me because if I go into, and, and this herd needs to be moved right now. Um, and that was the problem I ran into with this, this current case. And because of this current case, MDARD um, is kind of addressing that issue now at the state level. So hopefully nobody else has to run into the same prob problems I did where instead of being able to seize all those animals right now and get them to a safe place where they can start to uh, be rehabbed or, or whatever, um, I couldn't move them until they were tested. So once the state vet, um, the highest guy at the state, forget his name right now, but um, once we had a discussion, he understood where I was coming from. So those things will change. And at one point he did call me back and said, hey, if you need to move those cows today, I'll come up there myself and help you. So he understood what was going on after a while, um, especially after his vet that came here to assist me, um, kind of let him know what was going on as well. So there are some things that are getting fixed at the state level and, um, you know, we'll do what we have to do. And Hopefully that situation has been remedied. If not, it will be very shortly. So that's where we're at with livestock. Any other questions? I know one thing that I get asked a lot as far as livestock is horses, um, sheltering and horses. Because horses are considered livestock. Um, it is, there's a, um, they're trying to fix it where like with livestock right now, as far as housing goes, I get a lot of calls, especially in the wintertime when the wind is kicking up and there's a bunch of snow. You know, these cows or horses don't have shelter to get into. And the way Michigan law reads is they need um, a windbreak, which can also be part of the landscape. So if they're in a ravine, there's enough of a windbreak there. If there's a row of trees, that can be considered a windbreak. Um, in my opinion, you know, cattle handle that pretty well and horses typically do as well. Um, I'm a horse girl, so I hate to see horses out in the snow, 
but I have horses and they have perfectly good shelters. And I'm telling you when it's raining and they have six inches of snow on them and ice hanging off their faces, they're standing outside their shelter. There's nothing wrong with their perfectly good shelter, but so they do handle it pretty well, but I know there are changes in the law coming to where it is going to be required that they have a three-sided shelter with a roof, you know, for appropriate size of the horse and blah, blah, blah. Um, I know that is coming down the pike. So, and most people I think do that already. Um, it's the poor cows that are gonna get left out of this. Um, any other questions with that? Any questions going back to the protection versus um, control shelter? Because I was killed with my bear. Oh my. But there was, there was, at that time, we had a bear season. It's still on a bear, but. That must have been one hungry bear to take down a horse. Well, we don't even know if that was what it was. I think they mm -hmm. were guessing from maybe bite marks or something. I don't right. Know, I don't know how they came up with that. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. And I did see bear if I was going home sometimes across the road, but I never had seen them. We had 80 acres and I never saw them in the woods. So. Right, right. But, you know. Wow. <laughs> I've never heard that before. A bear taking down a horse, but I don't maybe I don't know. I, and maybe it wasn't that it just could have been a good guess. Right. There's nothing that we never heard anymore and we never had any more trouble. Yeah. Well that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> okay, so Michigan dog law was um became law in nineteen nineteen. Um, and the reason that became law, the biggest thing with Michigan dog law was the requirement of the rabies vaccination and a dog license. Um, and I did give you a handout on why do I need a dog license? That is probably one of the biggest questions I get um, all the time. So uh, the stuff on there will kind of point you in the right direction. Um, rabies is still an issue in Michigan. We do have rabies here in Alpena County. I know we've had bats test positive. Um, we probably don't test enough animals, I think, especially wildlife. You know, if they get rabies, they're probably dying out in the woods and we don't even know about it. Um, they just had, I don't know if you saw the, the news where the rabid fox bit, I think it was a congressman or congresswoman coming out of the White House down in Washington, D.C. And, you know, everyone that had anything to do with that fox is now um, kind of in quarantine and, and getting the post-exposure shots and vaccines and, and whatnot. Um, so it does still exist. Um, <clears throat> and we had a positive cat here. It was either last year or the year before down in Oakland County. Um, there were a bunch of people that were exposed to a positive cat there. Um, I would have put money last year on a dog um, that I took into my possession. Um, it was immediately euthanized and sent off for testing. I would have Put a bunch. Of, I would have put a bunch of money that that dog was going to be positive, um, but it did not come back positive, thankfully. Um, so it, 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 you know, it's it's worth noting that it was a good vaccination protocol um, that really cut back on the numbers of rabies. And I just recently posted on the Animal Control Facebook page. I don't know if you saw it, where five people in the United States died from rabies last year. And that was the most since like 1980. <clears throat> um, and I think people are getting too lax. Um, and so I am, I'm a big stickler on dogs being up to date on rabies. Uh, the dog license itself will, is proof to me that the dog is up to date on, on, it's a way to track your dog. So if you think of your dog like a car, this is how I explain it to people. <laughs> They're like, why do I need a dog license? I'm like, why do you need tags on your license plate? Kind of the same thing. Um, you know, we can look up the license plate and it tells us everything we need to know about the vehicle. That dog tag tells us everything we need to know about the dog. Um, and it comes in handy with us. So when I bring in a stray dog that has a dog tag on it, I don't even have to take it to the shelter. If I'm the one that picks it up, I don't even have to take it to the shelter. It doesn't have to spend one second in the shelter. I can bring it right home because I know who the owner is, I know how to contact the owner, and I know where they live. Um, that's the biggest thing about it. Um, the license fees, they are important um, for funding animal control. The fees that we do take in in the county do come back to animal control. So that does help to pay for staff at the animal control shelter. Um, 
you know, it goes back to the general fund and then the general fund comes into our budget. So we do get that money back um, into animal control. And it allows us to have the staffing and the ability to do the pro to bring to the community the programs that we do, like our low cost uh, vaccination clinics. And we were doing some low cost spay neuter um, for cats um, with Dr. Woman. Um, we haven't been able to do that the last few months. Um, hopefully that will change here very soon. Um, so stay tuned. Um, hope, we hope to bring that back real soon. Um, dog license is also proof of ownership. So everyone thinks a microchip is proof of ownership, but it's not. Um, it does tell us at one point that person was an owner of the dog. Um, not very many people are, are very good at keeping up on that information and keeping it current. That's the biggest thing we see with a microchip is we'll scan it and we'll call that person and, oh, I gave that dog away. And then that person gave that dog away and that person gave that dog away. Or it comes back to the shelter that actually inserted the microchip, but the person never, you know, never uh, put their information in, associated it with the chip or the veterinary clinic will insert the chip for you, but they don't call the company um, to give them your information. They, they, you know, have you do it. And each, there used to be just home again. There's a bunch of chip companies now. Um, each one's different. Each one offers a little bit of, you know, something that the other one doesn't offer. We use 24 Pet Watch at the animal control shelter. Um, they've been real nice to deal with. Once we give them information on the chip and the owner of that chip and the, the dog's information, uh, you don't have to do anything unless something changes. You don't have to renew every year. You don't have to, you know, call them every year and verify that, you know, the dog is still active and, or anything like that. So I really like them. Um, a dog license does prove ownership. Um, and again, it just, you know, it ensures that the rabies vaccination is up to date. Um, there are times when you can buy a dog license and some place in that year, your rabies vaccination will lapse. So if I punch in the number and your dog is licensed, but it's not up to date on rabies, the license is still licensed, but you're going to get in trouble for not having your dog up to date on rabies. So, you know, when your vet clinic or treasurer says, Hey, you know, your, your license ex or the rabies expires this month, make sure you get it, get it up to date and then give them information so that they can update that information in the system. Um, Going back to humane investigations, again, that's, that's the biggest thing that animal control does. And those are the animals that we have mostly at the shelter. We do get some owner surrenders. Um, when somebody comes forward and wants to surrender ownership of a dog, um, I kind of put it back on them a little bit because one, we try to keep animals out of the shelter. We're not, we're not big on hurry up and trying to fill the shelter with, with animals. Um, so I did start a Facebook page. It's home to home adoptions in Alpena County and surrounding areas. Um, so that people have a place to post stuff like that, trying to rehome the animal themselves. Um, cause there's nobody that knows that animal and can answer more questions than the owner. Um, and then they can make sure and ensure that they are adopting that dog out to somebody that they think is going to be a good owner. Um, you know, it also makes them take some responsibility and not just being able to just dump their problem on somebody else. Um, the second thing I ask them to do if, if that's not working um, is to contact a protection shelter. A protection shelter's job is to take in homeless and unwanted animals. Those are the animals that they take into the shelter. So those are your owner surrenders or um, your homeless cats, homeless dogs. Um, after their We'll go back to homeless dogs. So if a stray dog comes in, there's a legality associated with that dog, which is why those animals, all stray dogs need to come to animal control because it's a legal issue. It's actually illegal for a protection shelter to take in a stray dog. They can be ticketed for that. Um, once the stray, so we'll get on the stray hold real quick. Michigan used to have a straight hold where it was four days if the dog did not possess some type of identification that would prove that that dog has an owner, like a collar or a harness or even a, just a bandana, microchip, something that says, hey, I'm somebody's property. Um, so four days if they don't have that and seven days if they do. That was the old Michigan straight hold. 
Michigan did away with their stray hold and they're now allowing counties to decide what the stray hold is going to be. Um, we're real lucky here in Alpena County, at least I feel lucky because um, our county animal ordinance is basically Michigan law. So we still keep that old um, stray hold number of days. Uh, we, we still maintain that. And since Michigan law is also kind of our animal control ordinance, they, they coincide with one another. Um, I have the discretion to write when I do write tickets, um, what I, it can either be a civil infraction ticket or it can be a misdemeanor. Um, you know, I'm not big on, on bringing misdemeanor charges on a bunch of people. So I try to handle most things, um, civilly, and these civil tickets are not cheap. Um, so if I write somebody for having no dog license, um, or no rabies vaccination is $150 fine. If your dog is running at large and you receive a civil infraction ticket is $250. If you're operating a kennel, um, and you don't have a kennel license, it's a $500 fine. So these civil infraction tickets are not cheap. Um, going back to owner surrenders is where I was. I will, I will get off on the subject all the time. <laughs> I have to bring myself back. So owner surrenders, um, try to rehome the dog themselves, ask your protection shelter, if the protection shelters say no for whatever reason, um, and we're kind of a last resort, um, they will bring the dog to us. We'll evaluate the dog, make sure it's adoptable. Um, animal control, those of us at the animal control shelter, we will not adopt out an aggressive dog. Um, and I'm talking aggressive. I'm not talking a fearful dog or a reactive dog. Some of those dogs can be worked with. I'm talking the dog that can't wait to find another dog or another animal and, and attack it. Um, the ones that go out of their way to get out of a backyard and go run down the block and attack a dog. Those are the, or a person, those are the dogs I'm talking about. We do not adopt those out. Um, sometimes they come in a pretty package and those are the ones that will haunt me for the rest of my life where, and they're not always pits. Um, the worst dog I've ever come across was actually a one-year-old black lab. Um, she was uh, euthanized, but that was by far the most aggressive dog I've ever met in my life. Um, so the pretty packages that will haunt me forever are the dogs that come in and they are super people friendly. They love every human being there is that you know crosses their path, but they will kill any animal that they come across they want to attack that animal. Um, you know, they come out of their, their kennels and they're already hunting. You know, if a dog doesn't like a cat, I can live with that. That's kind of natural. Um, but when a big dog is so dog aggressive that you have to worry about them killing another dog, I will not adopt those out. Those dogs are euthanized. Um, we do euthanize. Um, I've never hidden that fact that, you know, it is what it is. We, we are as transparent as we possibly can be. Um, if you want to know what we do at the shelter, I always tell everyone, come volunteer, come spend a day with us and see for yourself what we do. Um, that's the best way to get to know us and get to know what we do and how we do it. Um, since I took over the animal control position in 2017, we have had no kill statistics um, ever since. And let me explain what no kill is. No kill does not mean that shelter doesn't kill animals, that they don't euthanize. It's not a never kill thing and it never should be. There are some animals that are a public, a danger to the public and should not be adopted out. I will make you the promise that I will always make that decision as difficult as it is. Public safety is my number one concern. Um, I do speak for those that have no voice. I will, you know, speak for the animals all day long, but if they are a public danger, they will not make it out of our shelter. Um, I forgot where I was going with that one. It's kind of a hot subject. <laughs> um, no kill statistics. So no kill 
means that 90% of the animals that enter the shelter alive leave the shelter alive. So nine out of 10 animals, they come in alive, they have to leave alive. Whether they are returned to their owner, adopted out, transferred to another shelter or rescue organization, whatever, they left the shelter alive. Um, we've been no kill since, I, like I said, uh, 2017. We took in 217 animals um, with a 95% save rate. 2018, we took in 95 animals and a 98, almost 99% save rate, 98.94%. 2020, we took in, I'm sorry, 2019, we took in 219 animals for 96.8% save rate. 2020, we took in 285 animals for a 96.7% save rate. And in 2021, we took in 296 animals for a 98.7% save rate. Uh, and I'm proud of those statistics. And the reason I bring them up all the time is because Animal control back in the day used to be a 60% kill shelter, meaning six out of 10 animals that came in didn't make it out. Um, so that was, that was one of my big things that I wanted to do when I got in was make sure that we're doing our best. Yeah, if we're bringing in an animal that is adoptable, that it leaves the shelter alive. I don't wanna kill or euthanize animals for space or because they're Time is up. Um, that's not going to happen. If they're adoptable, they're going to they're going to leave the shelter alive one way or the other. Um, I do transfer animals out of the area sometimes for their own safety. So, like I said, animal control deals with neglect and abuse. So, if I have to worry about that animal being adopted out into our community and possibly getting back into the hands of the people that neglected and abused those animals, I will transfer them out of the area. Um, I've transferred them as far away as Alabama. So um, we will do that for their own safety. Um, any questions yet? Yes. <laughs> so um, at the, we call we refer to it as the garage at the garage at the fairgrounds <laughs> the animal control shelter at the fairgrounds have you ever been okay so you've seen you've seen how big it is um no so we have i call it the ikea shelter really because every room has multiple <laughs> multiple uses so the first room when you walk into the shelter there's a small room there there's a couple um crates and those that's our intake room so if a stray dog comes in or law enforcement brings a dog in after hours they'll put them in those crates um, most animals that come in as a stray are claimed within 24 hours so they don't spend much time in the shelter most go home the same day if they are unclaimed after 24 hours 99.9% .9 of the time nobody comes forward to claim claim those animals so we start the vaccination process and, and getting them ready to, to put them up for adoption at that point. Um, sometimes we'll wait for the stray hold to be up before we start taking adoption applications, sometimes not. Um, sometimes we like to hurry up and speed that up, especially if the shelter is getting close to being at capacity or is already at or over capacity. So we can move that along. Um, nothing leaves our shelter that is age appropriate until it's been spayed and neutered. That has kind of been a problem lately. Um, our spay neuter appointments are out, you know, up to two or three weeks at this point. So what we've been doing is uh, foster to adopt. And what it is, is basically you're adopting that animal, but it's not legally or technically adopted. We don't do the adoptions. We don't follow through with the adoption until the animal is altered. And we set that up. We tell them what vet to be to at what time. They drop it off, pick it up, and then come to us. We fill out the, you know, we, we complete the adoption at that time. So that way I ensure and make sure that all those animals are, um, and that's with dogs. Cats, I will not let leave until they are fixed. <laughs> we have a big cat overpopulation problem. I will not take a chance that a cat is going to escape somebody and go reproduce some more. <laughs> dogs are a little easier. Um, 
I'm getting the impression that dogs are licensed primarily as a rabies control mechanism. Right. And cats <laughs> are not licensed. Right. They used to be back in the day. And the problem the state and the counties all realized was, how do you enforce that? They're the number one dumped animal in the country. Mm -hmm. So if you know that the freebie cat you got at somebody's garage sale um, is going to cost you money to get back or to get spayed, neutered, vaccinated, whatever, uh, most people would just dump that animal and never claim it. So it didn't fix anything. Um, then they tried passing laws where if you own a cat, it had to be mandatory spay neuter. Um, if cats were picked up and they weren't spayed or neutered, they were euthanized. That didn't work either. <laughs> um, it actually, cat populations actually increased with that. I, I did look that up and I, it boggles my mind, but for whatever reason, cat populations went up. Um, the thing, the only thing that has proven to work with cats is TNR, which is your trap neuter return programs. That actually has been a proven program throughout the, the country for over a decade now. That is a proven way to fix cat overpopulation problems. Um, the problem is it costs money. And most people want the problem fixed. They just don't want to be part of the solution. So I always tell people if it is that big of a problem, put your money where your mouth is, help us out. Is there any difference in the rabies risk between cats and dogs? There is not, there is not. Is there a trap neuter release uh, organization in this area? There is, there is. Um, Cindy Strobel brought the trap neuter return um, program to this area. And uh, they are on Facebook. I believe this, I don't know if they have a phone number yet that people can call, but I know they ask that people contact them off of Facebook. So if you go to Northeast Michigan TNR, that's their Facebook page. You can message them. They answer usually within a minute, I think is, is what it says on there. So they're answering pretty quickly. Um, I have the number of the bat phone, but I don't think she'd like me to share that with everybody. <laughs> but yes, that program is actually, you know, it is proven to work. So, um, you know, it would be nice if we can get some of the local governments to uh, put some, some money into that program. I know one of the big hangups, um, that TNR was getting was people want the cats removed from their area. Like come trap them, get them out of here. We don't want them back. Well, that kind of negates that what the program's all about is they trap the cats, they and they vaccinate them for rabies, and then they return them to those areas. So they're not reproducing. That cat clan or whatever you want to call it is not getting any larger. Problem is, if we do what those people want, if we take those cats out of that area, there's more cats going to move right in, right away. Um, so you kind of want to maintain that spayed and neutered clan to keep all the other cats out, and eventually they're going to they're going to die off. The average lifespan for a for an outdoor 100% outdoor cat is only 18 months. Yep. Um, I think the average lifespan for a cat that's indoor outdoor is like six to eight years. It's not very long either. And then the average lifespan for a cat that spends its entire life in the house is like 18 to 20 years. So <laughs> depends how much you like your cat. <laughs> yes. It was nearly impossible to because of But what 
I did was I didn't want him to go hungry. So I fed them and a friend of mine who does rescue did come and, and uh, trap them for me. And then she eventually found homes for them, which is, was really great. But feral cats are, I'm sure, a, a big problem. They are a big problem. Yeah. So I know, um, I think Second Chance does this. So that's your second protection shelter in the area. They're not licensed yet, but they will be shortly uh, as soon as their building's ready. Right now, they're, they're basically kind of a, um, a 501c3 foster rescue mm -hmm. is what they're working under right now. But I think they do this. I'm not sure what the Humane Society does. Um, and I will do this on occasion when we have room. Should probably go back to the, sh the shelter because at our current shelter, you said, how much space do you have? Um, and so remind me to go back there real quick. I don't wanna forget to go back there again because I kind of squirreled mm -hmm. in the other direction. Okay. So, um, one thing I know, I think Second Chance does it for sure. I'm pretty sure they do. Um, and I will every once in a while if I have room mm -hmm. is I do this with dogs. That's where all those black lab puppies came from. Um, if somebody gets overwhelmed, this is where the last few litters have come from, actually, because we've ended up with whole litters. But what happens is these people get overwhelmed. And we're looking at a hoarding situation kind of on that fence. Um, I go in there and, and I'm not all about tickets and criminal charges or anything like that. I'd rather fix the problem. How do we fix this problem so it doesn't happen again? So I sit down with these people. And I'm like, okay, here's what we have going on. If you're willing to spay and neuter all of your animals and stop breeding, I will take the puppies and get them adopted out to good homes. Um, so that's what we've done with the last few litters that you've seen the people that had those litters and the parents to those litters, everything is spayed and neutered mm -hmm. um, in order for us to take them. And I know that's kind of what shelters have been doing as far as cats go to, um, is working with owners um, where we will take the litters off their hands or we'll foster mom and the litter until the litters are old enough to be adopted out. And then they will have to pay to get mom spayed and then they can have mom back and then you know, we don't have to worry about any more litters. That's one way of dealing with it. Um, problem is most people can't or refuse to pay current costs for spay and neuter, um, especially, especially cats, the number one dumped animal. I mean, I think we're up around $300 for a spay right now. Um, I am trying to bring some low cost spay and neuter. We did it with Dr. Woman at the animal control shelter for a couple of years and we, we had a notebook full of people on that list and we just kept going down the list and doing as many as we can. And I think at that time we were charging 85 for a spay and 50 for a neuter. And I hope to even write for some grants in my spare time <laughs> to bring that cost down even less. Um, once I have another veterinarian that's willing to come into the shelter and do that. And we're working on that right now. So just kind of pay attention to the page for that. Um, I hate to count my chickens before they hatch, but it's, there's some exciting stuff on the on the back burner right now. Um, it's nice to follow up the Facebook. Right. Second chance and also it's like, and I saw it was garbage. <laughs> right. Um, so that that's one thing that we can do to help people out. Um, again, it's putting some responsibility on them. You know, I, I'm not going to take your litter if you're just going to have another litter, you know, six months from now. Um, and this is an ongoing problem. So how do you fix it? And part of that is putting the responsibility back on the owner. Um, and sometimes, you know, these people get these cute kittens cause they're cute and they already can't afford to spay and neuter. I tell people, please don't get a dog or cat. If you don't already have the money for the, the spay and neuter, if it's not already there, if you can't already do it, don't get that animal. Um, because you will not save, <laughs> you'll, you'll keep spending that money on something else. And when that female comes into heat for the first time at four to six months, they can get pregnant at four months. So we do, um, I wouldn't call it a pediatrics day in neuter on cats, but it sort of kind of is because they're pretty young. As soon as they're four pounds, they're getting spayed and neutered. Um, dogs were a little bit 
more lenient on. Um, there are two trains of thoughts, and this just came up not that long ago. Um, yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, there are some veterinarians that are kind of pushing the waiting um, until animals are older now <coughs> um, to do spays and neuters because of certain types of cancers or hormonal um, issues, bone growth, stuff like that. Um, there is some evidence that proves that if you do wait, some of those things are, you know, are less in occurrence. Um, and then there's another group of veterinarians who promote early spay and neuter, um, especially those of us that have, especially veterinarians that are associated with or have experience in animal welfare or shelters because they see what we're dealing with. And you can't take the chance on those animals becoming pregnant. So there are some shelters that will do pediat pediatric spays and neuters, literally cats. Um, I, when I was in Denver, we were doing kittens at a pound and a half, almost two pounds. Um, so you and kittens are easy to age up until about six months. They're one pound per month until about six months. So if you have a two pound kitten, it's about two months old. If you have a four pound kitten, it's about four months old. So that's kind of one way to, to age your kittens. Um, and, and like Florida, they will do puppies at eight weeks. So we don't do that. Um, I'm more strict with female dogs than I am male dogs um, as to when we get them altered. If we have a chance to do them before they're adopted out, that's our main goal. But like I said, some of our spay and neuter appointments are so far out that I don't want to hold them in the shelter if we have a good adoptive home that can keep them out of trouble until that spay and neuter appointment shows up. So um, females will get spayed before nine months. I will not let them go through a heat cycle because I don't think the trade-off with um, mammary cancer is okay because these other things might happen if we don't wait. Um, males, I'm a little more lenient with. Um, they're not the, the puppy factories. You know, they're part of it, but they're not the puppy factory. So um, we do, when we have a large litter, we do spay first and then neuter. That's just part of responsible sheltering, in my opinion. Um, where did I want to go back to? The shelter. So the capacity at the shelter. The intake room has two intake crates. Um, and I just, <laughs> we finally had enough money at our, uh, in our, our donation fund to get some real heavy duty crates because <laughs> some of these dogs that we bring in, especially, you know, your your pit mixes or those larger dogs with major separation anxiety, they are just ripping the heck out of our crates. Um, we've walked in a couple times to the dog wandering around like, Hey, how you doing? Um, so nothing will break out of the crates I just bought. So there's two crates in there as far as um, initial intake. There's also shelving on the right hand side that has our food pantry. So any food that is donated to us other than what we use, um, we keep our foods, we feed a certain food so that we're not always changing food, creating digestive issues for the animals in our care. Um, so anything that's donated to us goes into the food pantry so that people who are struggling to feed their animals, or if we come across, you know, a hoarding where I need a bunch of food real quick um, to keep those animals sustained until I can get there to remove them, then we'll use, we'll use that. Um, and then straight ahead is our bathroom slash overflow <laughs> for stray dogs slash quarantine room for sick cats. <laughs> um, we have a couple of cages in there for that type of stuff. Um, that room has a fan in there. So the air is, you know, circulates out. Plus we have an air purifier in there for anything that may be airborne. So anything that looks a little shady goes in that room. Um, then once they're vaccinated, they go into our main kennel room. In our main kennel room, we have um, five kennels, five four by four kennels in there. And I'm going to expand on that real soon because we are all since for the last year, we've been over or at capacity full time. Um, so we need some more kennels real quick because I'm not... I'm not okay keeping dogs in crates for days and days and days on end. Um, 
So anyway, there's five kennels in there right now. There is some storage in on shelving. Um, and then it's also our laundry room where our washer and dryer is. <laughs> um, then we have an office. Our office is also our exam room. And it also is um, a surgery room. So if we're going to do surgeries, um, trust me, it is all clean. Um, as clean as you could possibly get it when we do surgeries in there. Um, it is also our cat room. So we have six cat kennels in there. So when people say, why don't you take all these cats? I have six, I have six kennels for cats. Where do you want me to put them? Um, you cannot house cats and dogs in the same room. So we can't, every, and we have, we have, I've self-reported to the state a couple times where we've had to um, take in a large number of cats right away and not have a place to put them. So there may be some dogs in the kennels. We will run a barrier between the dogs and the kennel, the dogs and the cats and um, get them out as soon as possible. Um, and then we have a quarantine room that has two kennels in there. There's one that's five by five, one that's five by six. Those kennels are just made out of, um, they consist of a bunch of extra stuff that we just put together to make some bigger kennels. Um, that's where we put our bite quarantine dogs, our naughty dogs, I call them, um, or our extra large animals that just aren't comfortable or wouldn't be comfortable in one of our smaller cages or kennels. And then that's also where we store um, some of the, the shelter dog food and cat food. So every room has multiple. This idea about using the former sheriff's department for animals, is that part of what you're talking about? Or? Glad you bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> that is my, my goal right now. Yes. Is to um, renovate that building into the animal, the new animal control shelter. Never even gave it a second thought. Um, Cause I'm like most people, I only look at that building and all I think of was it used to be a jail. Mm -hmm. um, and when it used to be a jail, it'd been a jail for so like it no longer met requirements for uh, the Michigan Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. There was nothing you were going to be able to do to that jail um, using your money wisely, I guess, to make it where it was going to meet all those requirements anymore. So it just wasn't going to function as a jail anymore. Um, and I think once they realized that they probably st stopped doing a bunch of maintenance to it, it was band-aids. Um, and it wasn't until New Year's Eve when I ran into my latest and last hoarding situation. Um, and that started out as I was called out New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock at night, 10 or 11 o'clock at night um, for a fatal car crash. Um, and they told me that there were four cats in the car would you please come get the cats? Sure. So I drove in. Um, it was immediately apparent to me when I got to the vehicle, inside the vehicle was just, it was full of stuff. Um, and that is, it's just one of the signs that you see when, when you're dealing with somebody who hoards. And the fact that there were four cats and there already had me, you know, the wheels were already turning, like maybe she was homeless. Maybe they were all just living in the car, doing what they could. I was hoping that's what it was. Um, when I removed the cats, I realized what the cats were. When I realized that they were Havana Browns, I knew from working in the veterinary clinics, like I said, I've been a licensed tech for over 20 years. Um, I knew who the only breeder in this area was of the, that particular breed of cat. And they're rare. They're, there's like 3,000 in the United States. Um, I confirmed who it was. They said, yes, um, it was late that night. So I took those four cats to the animal control shelter. The next morning I started my investigation as to, um, and I, I've known this lady from the, you know, from working in the clinic and I never, ever, ever would have guessed that there were things going on like that. Um, and when I went to the residence, I knew driving in, um, 
my windows were down. I, I could smell a hoarding from a mile away <laughs> at this point. Um, and unfortunately, it's just become an area where, unfortunately, I've become an expert in. We've had so many of them here, and there's still so many to take care of that we already know about. Um, it's just having the room um, and the time and, and resources to put into those types of um, complaints. But anyway, so show up to the house and uh, it, it was immediately apparent what, what was going on there. <laughs> so I left, made a couple phone calls, started going down my list. I have my people that I call and, you know, they're always there for me. And we just started doing what we do. And where do you put them? There had to be close 80 to 100 cats in that house. There had to be close to 100 cats. Um, there are still cats in that house that never made it out of that house. Some of them, and I, I, I said it before, um, it was so bad those cats were eating one another. They were killing and eating one another. Um, so whether they didn't make it out because of that, but I do know there were some that when we set the live traps the last time, there was a big hole in the, the ceiling and get up into the, the insulation and stuff. And then when we went up into the attic, we had traps in the attic, we had traps down below waiting for them to come down. We knew they were hungry um, and thirsty and stuff. So we had all that, they had to get in a trap to get food. And when we set those traps the last time, there had to been at least 20 or 30 more cats that went up into up into the ceiling. And that next morning when I pulled one cat in a trap out of there and we never saw it anymore. So we can only assume that they are deceased. There was no way to get out of the house. So um, I still want to get in there and find out what happened because that has bugged me ever since. I've gone out there. I went out there every day for a week trying to figure out like I left food. Um, nothing was being touched. I left water. So I don't know what happened. But anyway, um, what do we do with all those cats? <laughs> Where do they go? Um, we were full um, as far as we were over capacity at that point with dogs. Um, and one of the volunteers there that day said, hey, what about using the old jail? And I'm like, you know, you might be onto something. Even if we have them lined up in the hallways, like it's, there's nowhere else to go with them. Um, the state of Michigan had okayed us to use the merchant's building as an overflow. Um, that has been approved as a secondary animal shelter for temporary housing when situations like this come up. Um, we made the call, the county commissioner said, no go, can't use it um, because they were doing uh, COVID testing or vaccinations or something once a week. Hey, what do you want me to do with these cats? So when she brought up the old jail, I was like, you know what? That's, that's a brilliant idea. So I called my sergeant, sergeant called the under sheriff. Everyone said, yeah, go ahead, do what you have to do. So we went over there. I let everybody in um, while they were setting up everything that needed to be set up. Um, one of my fellow ACOs from Mount Segal County came over to help me clear cats out of the house. Um, we went to the house and just started removing cats and bringing them in, throwing them to the volunteers, grabbing more crates and going back. Um, and we did that for three days. Um, and that's again, when we knew there were more cats, but there weren't any more cats. <clears throat> um, it did not take long for us to figure out after being there, working with those 46 cats, that was the perfect building for an animal control shelter. Every single one of those cells can be at a moment's notice, a quarantine room. Every single one of them. There's four on what would be the dog side. So the side closest to Johnson Street. On the back side towards the hospital, there are four large cells about as big as this room for cats. Now with four rooms, the size of this, do you know how many hoardings we could clean up in this County and finally make, like make a dent and start saving some of these animals that are just waiting for us to find the time and the space to save them. So it'd be perfect. Um, it checks all the boxes on, 
on the MDARD shelter requirement list. We'll never be able to do that at the fairgrounds in the two car garage. We do our best. They are amazed every year when they come inspect us as to what we are doing out of that small building and how well we do it. Um, they're like, you are the model for what animal control shelters should be only in a bigger building. <laughs> so uh, one of the check boxes is that cats and dogs be separate from one another. The state of Michigan would prefer that they can't even hear one another. And that's almost obtainable at the jail. You can barely hear the dogs from the cat side when the doors are shut. Um, all of those cells, again, when these animals come into our, our care and custody, there's typically a legality associated with them. So they become at that point, yes, they're an animal. They're a living, breathing creature. They are somebody's property, but they now become our live evidence. So there's a chain of custody with live evidence, just like there is any other evidence removed from some other crime, like a breaking and entering. Um, we can secure each and every one of those cells. If we have evidence in there, we can't allow anybody else near. We can just lock the door. And it can be a quarantine room at the same time, every single one. So if one animal gets sick in this room, we can, boom, right immediately, it becomes a quarantine room. Um, the drunk tank was <laughs> a perfect puppy room. <laughs> That worked great for litters of puppies. Um, there is a bench in there um, that multiple people can go in there and actually play with this entire litter of puppies at the same time. And they don't even have to leave the room. There is um, maximum security area. There's three big cells back in there um, that is completely away from everything else and everybody else where we could put our uh, bite quarantine dogs. You would never have to worry about anybody coming close, um, sticking their fingers in there like, oh, he doesn't look so bad, you know, chomp. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the kitchen is huge, you know, as far as food prep and doing dishes and stuff like that. Um, we can, we food prep on one side, we do dishes on the other side. There's storage like we don't have, um, we, I added a storage building um, last year at the animal control shelter through donations. Um, the play yard over there was, everything over there is donations. Um, the county supplied the building, um, one of the big shelves that, the, that we store our food on, the five kennels in the main kennel room, the two in the quarantine room um, were there when I came in and the flooring. And then other than that, we pretty much run that place on donations. We reply, we rely on the community and, and donors and volunteers. Um, getting back to my dream over here, never in a million years would have thought of that place as an animal control shelter, but it works perfect. It checks all the boxes. Um, the old inmate attorney room where they used to meet um, is a great meet and greet room when somebody comes to meet an animal. The, the old um, where the control room used to be is, you know, would be a great office when people walk into that side of the building. The front office side where the deputies and the sheriff and under sheriff and all those people used to be, um, that is where we could have a low cost basic care um, facility for, for the community where you can go there and get your basic care for your animals. Cause that's what you get in trouble with me is you have to be able to provide basic care, which is vaccinations, um, low cost spay neuter, um, you know, skin issues, ear issues, stuff that doesn't require a bunch of diagnostic stuff like x-rays and blood work and stuff. That's not going to happen that you need to go to a traditional vet for that. We're just talking low cost stuff. Um, and it's not like people don't want to get that stuff done for their animals. They just can't afford it. Right now, it costs you over $50 just to walk in the door. Um, that's been my experience. Like I said, I'm going to go back to, I've been a licensed tech for over 20 years. I worked in clinics for, well, I've been at this job for five years. So 16 years, I was in a clinic. Thought I'd seen everything. 
you know, I used to judge those people who would come in and not do what the, the veterinarian told them to do because, you know, they couldn't afford it. I'm like, well, why do you even have that animal if you can't afford it? You shouldn't have an animal that you can't afford. I used to be that way of thinking. And then I got this job and I'm like, that's not how it is at all. You know, it sh these animals should not be a luxury item. Um, animals are proven to be good for mental health. We have a country that is in a mental health crisis. Your emotional support animals, your service animals, those are important animals. And more people should have access to these animals if they want an animal. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to go broke taking your dog to a vet. And I understand having worked in the clinic, they need to make money too. I get it. Uh, there has to be there has to be some, somewhere to meet in the middle where we can make this happen. And I'm kind of surprised, but Northeast Michigan doesn't have any low cost options here other than whatever mobile vet comes to tractor supply like once or twice a month, I think. Um, you know, and, and this last time he ran out of vaccines. <laughs> so, you know, people want to do that stuff. They have to be able to afford it. Um, and that's what I would like to, uh, to be able to offer to the community because that not only helps the community, it helps me out too, because you're, you're getting in trouble, by, you know, by me because you're not doing these, these things, but if they're not available for people, how do I expect them to do it? Um, so that's, I'm, I'm trying to bring that to the area. Um, I have a veterinarian who... Well, I have a few veterinarians who are, um, are willing to help out. Um, Dr. Blom comes over from the Petoskey area. He's the one that helps me with the low cost vaccination clinics that we do right now. Um, I have another veterinarian who has offered to help. She will be taking her boards. She just graduated. She'll be taking her boards the end of today, actually. Um, and then, you know, Dr. Woolman's always willing to help. He's a he's not spring chicken either <laughs> so you know um we're trying we're trying to make those things available i see where the problems are as far as um we're you know an animal control stance in the county i don't want to keep doing these same things over and over and over again i want to fix them so that my job gets easier not harder you know think think smarter not you know don't work harder so that's where we're at with that how did you take care of Forty-six cats, and how long did it take you to find homes for these? Oh Lord, I lived there. Oh, it was. Um, how did we take care of forty-six cats, and how much time did it take us to find homes for them all? So the this last hoarding was a little bit different than any other hoarding I've ever had to deal with, as far as. Um, and we're technically not supposed to call them hoardings. They're large scale animal neglect cases, but that's a mouthful and I'd rather just say hoardings. So um, this one was quite a bit different than any other one that I've ever dealt with. These cats, like I said, were rare. Most of them were purebred. Um, there were some domestic short hairs because this particular person um, was trying to bring back a color of the Havana breed that had been tried before, um, but was not hardy enough. So they stopped doing it because it was just kind of a genetic nightmare. And she wanted to try that again and, and make it a hardier breed. But I don't know if anyone paid attention to, um, when we brought these cats in, the domestic short hairs in the group um, actually looked pretty good. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually looked pretty good. It was the purebred cats that really struggled and were, were really, really sick, really, really skinny. Um, they were not hardy at all. Um, she was trying to bring back the lavender color is what she was trying to do. Um, because these were such rare cats, um, they were registered with what is called the CFA or Cat Fanciers Association. The, cat, the CFA is like the AKC to, 
C is to dogs, the American Kennel Club. So you have Cat, Pat, Cat Fanciers Association and the American Kennel Club. So the CFA um, came forward with another organization, um, the Breeders, um, it's specifically for breeders. It's so that breeders that are struggling can, can approach this organization and get some help. Um, obviously this person did not do that, but they came forward and approached me and said, Hey, we, we're kind of here to clean up the mess that, that our, uh, our breeder made. We're here to help you out. Um, and they offered to assume all of the monetary stuff associated with that. So any overtime, um, they actually paid for that, um, associated with that. <coughs> we used a lot of volunteers though. Um, so like, like me, yes, like yes. Yep. We had a lot of people come forward and, and volunteer. Um, and then we transferred all those cats to them. They, they had their veterinarians come forward and they would pick up the cat and they would go directly to their veterinarian. So we had, they had volunteers that came up here, would pick up six, seven, eight cats at a time, take them to their veterinarian, whether it was here in Michigan, Illinois, in Wisconsin, I believe were the three places that most of the cats were going to. They were medically treated, spayed, neutered if they were healthy enough. And then they go to foster homes. Once they're healthy enough to be adopted out, then they're placed up for adoption and then they adopt them out. That way it took all the pressure off of us. And that was really different for me. It was, <laughs> nobody ever comes forward to ask you for a bunch of cats. <laughs> so, you know, we, we took advantage of that because it was good for us. It was good for the cats. Um, you know, it got them into homes, foster homes and, and got all the medical care they needed. They'd spare no expense. Um, if they had a cat that needed a hip transplant, it got a hip transplant. We would never be able to afford that in our budget. Um, my budget, you're going to ask about my budget, right? <laughs> I get 2,500, I get my three part-timers, um, at the shelter, but they give me $2,500 a year in professional services to pay for veterinary costs and $2,500 a year for supplies. So basically $5,000 a year. So when they came forward and said, hey, we will pay for everything, all the medical costs, we will get them adopted out, we'll get them spayed and neutered. You know, that way I'm not overwhelming the veterinarians here trying to get 46 cats spayed and neutered <coughs> so we can get them adopted out. Um, it, it was a good thing for us and the cats. But anyway, it did take about to have get all that done all the paperwork and everything else. Um, I'm still working on paperwork. Um, it was roughly five or six weeks. Yeah. You know, yeah. Not bad at all. Wonderful. You know, and <clears throat> had it, had that been a, a, a typical, so a typical hoarding here in Alpena County, I would say an average number of animals that we take in is probably between 50 and 60. <clears throat> And we don't have that kind of room at our current location. So if we don't get the old jail, they're going to have to come up with somewhere that they're going to allow me to use, you know, at the drop of a, a, a pin to put those animals. Um, and we will never run out of room over there. That was, we could house evidence for surrounding areas that kind of have the same problem that we have right now. We can be that, you know, the model uh, the model shelter for everybody. So I hope it happens. Um, there is some stuff that needs to get addressed. We don't have to, um, you know, regulation wise, it's already been inspected by MDARD and they're like, yeah, this checks all the boxes. Like, I really hope this happens for you because they know what I'm working with at the fairgrounds <clears throat> and, uh, this checks all their boxes. So they're, they're about as stoked about it as I am. There's some stuff that needs to happen. Like it needs a new roof right now. Um, you know, it leaks the, um, the person, the company that put the last roof on, if the seal is good, if something up there is good, it, it's gonna run roughly $100,000 for a new roof. Um, to have the ducks cleaned, and we didn't go up on the roof because it was still winter time, so we couldn't get a, a quote quote, but roughly $4,000 to have the ducks cleaned out because they're gross. Um, and then eventually, you know, there's, there's other things that are going to have to get fixed. Eventually, you know, like windows will have to be replaced. 
Um, you know, I'm sure the pipes or boilers or whatever is going to need to be replaced at some point. Is that all immediate stuff? No. The immediate thing is the roof and the ducts. Those are the two things that need to get done right away. And then we need to work on the other stuff. Um, does it all have to get done right now? No. Um, I have donors that are willing to do, you know, to pay for, I have, I have a $10,000 donor um, that wants to um, donate the $10,000 to renovate one of the dog cells, <laughs> Calls the dog cells. So what we would do is we would um, have sponsors come in and sponsor those rooms to have them renovated. So I have a $10,000 sponsor for a dog room. I have a $10,000 sponsor for a cat room. Um, I have a $5,000 miscellaneous sponsor, um, use it wherever you need it type thing. Um, and then I have another sponsor who low cost cremation. So we offer some lower cost cremation services right now, but we ourselves use a company from out of town. Um, Sheboygan County Animal Shelter slash Animal Control um, has been doing their own cremation for over 20 years for the community. And they make roughly $34,000, $35,000 a year doing that. There's the money to maintain and help put back into this building to make those things happen. And I have a sponsor who is willing to sponsor the $15,000 startup fee to get the crematory up and running. Um, so there's that. Um, and then just our normal fundraising. Any questions about the old jail? Oh, yeah. asbestos. I hear about um, asbestos all the time. So there is, you know, I don't know where they're at. I think they hope that I'm going away, but I'm not going away anytime soon. I will fight for this community and the animals in it until I can't fight anymore. Um, so until they tell me, no, I'm going to keep plugging away at it. Um, but they, you know, they hear from me all the time, but they need to hear from the community. And, and what do you want? Um, you know, what questions do you have? And I get questions all the time. Well, it's full of asbestos. I don't think people understand or realize how much asbestos there still is in all of these buildings. Um, it's there as long as it is sealed and it doesn't become airborne, it's not a problem. So if it's wrapped and it's sealed, it's not a problem. Don't disturb it, leave it alone. Um, and most of it, from what I've been told, most of it has been removed. There's still some there, but most of it's been removed and the stuff that's there is, is sealed and, and not a problem, so. Well, you're doing a wonderful job, let me tell you that. I'm trying. It is definitely a lot for one person. Um, <laughs> we do need another animal control officer. That'll be my next battle. That's my next battle. <laughs> for Zoom land. That's my next battle. <laughs> we do need another animal control officer. This, you know, there are people that are calling with legit complaints and they're complaints that I will never get to. There's just not enough time. Um, it doesn't do me, it doesn't do the animals any justice for me running from, from complaint to complaint to complaint if I don't have time to sit in front of my computer and actually do the report and get it up to the prosecutor so that these people can be prosecuted. Um, that's the problem I'm having right now. It's finding the time in front of the computer. But this is also important too, is the community needs to understand what animal control is about and what we do and why we're so important. And that is one big subject that I have not touched on yet. Why, is, why do we even care about animal control? It's not just about the animals. It's about us too. It's about the community. There is a there's a bunch of proof out here that shows this. And I don't know if people started paying attention when the FBI said we need to start a database on people who neglect and abuse animals, just like we do our sex offenders. They are, there's a database for animal abusers and people who neglect animals. Why is that? They don't do it just because they care about the animals. It's because animal neglect and animal abuse is a precursor to violent crimes against people. And this is where I am blessed to be a law enforcement officer as well, because when I go to <clears throat> typically starts out as a welfare check, somebody will call in because they're worried about some animals somewhere. <clears throat> and I will go out and do a welf welfare check. 
if there is animal neglect or animal abuse happening, right away I'm starting to look at where's the human side of this. Because I guarantee if there is animal neglect going on, there is human neglect going on as well. Whether it be adult neglect or child neglect, it's happening somewhere. If they're neglecting the animals, they're neglecting people too. And the same thing goes for abuse. If they are abusing animals, and we see this a lot with domestic violence, if they are abusing animals, domestic violence is the first thing I'm looking for. They go hand in hand. So animal neglect, animal abuse go hand in hand with crimes against humans. And I'm not talking any crimes. I'm talking violent crimes too. This is, you know, it's not just about the psychopaths. You don't have to be killing animals to be a psychopath. Not all psycho, not all people who kill animals are psychopaths. If that makes sense. So that is why animal control is so, to me, that's the number one thing. Yes, I'm the voice for the, the voiceless and I'm the dog catcher and I'm the, you know, the shelter manager person, whatever. I'm the keeper of live evidence, but why is all that important? It's because we can start looking for those crimes against people too. They go hand in hand. I'm still trying to get some law enforcement officers to understand that too. <laughs> hey, when you go there and you have this happening, look for this. They go hand in hand. They're, they're together. Any questions? Thank you for taking the time to come and give us this wonderful presentation. Thank you for inviting me.